you know, if you could build it from scratch and do it right, what would you do? Okay, welcome back to the Marketing Playbook presented by Details Interactive. Here are your takeaway three game-winning marketing plays every episode to take back to your team. I'm your host, Mark Friedman, and my career has been focused on direct-to-consumer marketing, direct mail, physical retail, and digital commerce. This is episode number 33, and today's guest is Sam Norpel, Chief Digital Officer of Juvenescence. Before we get started, a quick thank you as always to Max Brandstetter of the Wild Business Growth Podcast for producing this episode. You can reach him at max at maxpodcasting.com to help bring your podcast to life. Let's open the playbook. Ready, break. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Marketing Playbook Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Sam Norpel, who's the Chief Digital Officer of Juvenescence Life, a life science company targeting the intrinsic mechanisms of aging. Juvenescence Life is focused on the commercialization of IP-protected dietary products and functional foods that can help improve health span and lifespan. Sam, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Well, it's nice to see you. Uh, it's been a while. Um, we are recording here today, uh, I guess, the uh, Ides of March, uh, the middle of March 2021. How are you and your family doing? Very, very well. It's hard to believe it. it's been a year since COVID started and everything is different. Everything is indeed differently. And uh, I'm glad that we, we were able to find some time to do this. Uh, so thanks. So let's jump right in. You know, one of the things that I like to do when we uh, we start these shows is get something from the guest that is a bit remarkable or fascinating, either about their life, their career. It doesn't necessarily have to uh, have anything to do with, you know, the work that you're doing. But, you know, it just gives the, the, uh, the listener a little flavor about Sam. Is that when I went to school a long time ago, I won't tell you when I graduated, but this career didn't exist. And I was on my path to becoming a professor. I had continued after undergrad to get a graduate degree. And I planned to teach the future students of the future about communication. And one day this little thing called the internet came about and I thought, oh, I want to learn how to code HTML pages. I want to make web pages. That sounds fun. And I signed up for this webmaster certificate program at the University of Delaware in the middle of my master's degree and started learning Photoshop and how to code. And you know, here I am all these years later. And probably the, the most interesting thing, of course, is technology has changed so much. When people hear I have this webmaster certificate, it has this like very you know sexy sound to it when really in the end of the day, it's HTML1. So very, very long time ago. That's great. And, and is there anything in your, you know, your upbringing that, you know, other than what you were studying that kind of foreshadowed the fact that you'd be in, in something that was kind of technical, um, you know, although much of what you do may not be technical, you know, as a, as a chief marketing officer, but uh, anything in that background that, that gave you thoughts of where you'd end up? Not really. I mean, again, I think technology, other than we had an Apple computer, as I was growing up and my dad was always, you know, a big fan of Max, um, there really wasn't anything significant to say you're going to go into technology. I don't even think I know that knew that the time that IT exists, you know, really, I think what, what interests me was I had been on the yearbook staff in high school and I enjoyed photography and laying out pages, this idea that I could create pages that would somehow exist online for lots of people to see something about that was fascinating to me. So you thought about the fact that the book that you were creating would would be online at some point? I think it was just this idea that, oh my gosh, people are now making web pages. Oh, and I guess when I was in grad school, my assistantship was working for the Journal of Broadcasting and Electronic Media. I actually was editing college professors' transcripts that they sent in, and I would be working on these print pieces and then realizing because I also worked at the school library, that a lot of this material was now being put online, that somehow these publications were going to become digital. And what did that mean? And then maybe maybe I can have my own website or something like that. There was just something about the physical aspect of paper that I've always enjoyed 
but also this idea that now it's something that could be put online and that many people could access. And at the time, honestly, my parents were living in Europe. They were living, I think, at by that point in gosh, they were in Germany for seven years. They left me when I was, and I do say left me when I was a senior in college to go, to go live abroad. And so this idea that I could just send them a link to something and that they'd be able to see it was just so new. And, and I, I think it really just inspired me a little bit. That's interesting. It's funny, as you were talking about uh, laying out the uh, yearbook, I did that in my high school, going out for type and you know, everything was, you know, nothing was digital. It was all, you know, old traditional way of laying out these books. And um, maybe that's how I got into my catalog days of uh, yes. catalog marketing. You mentioned University of Delaware and you went there with the intention of some kind of a communications uh, background. I actually started in psychology. You know, I just did not know what I wanted to major in. So I guess that's, and my parents said, no, you need to pick a major. So I chose psychology. And I think that was probably because I've always been fascinated in how people tick. And that at some point I was really interested in communication and the idea of mass media. You know, as a comms degree today, students can get a degree in what is called new media. But at the time, new, new media didn't really exist. And I didn't have the foresight to see that I was actually on the precipitous of new media could have been my dissertation. When you and I first met, you were working with a company called GSI Commerce. Tell us about that business model. You know, that was really the precursor of a lot of what we see today. So tell us about the business model and the, the various roles that you had there. GSI Commerce, as you know, was founded by Michael Rubin outside in his garage. GSI Commerce became the first really e-commerce platform that was out there and sold to retailers. He recognized that companies that were trying to get their businesses online really struggled. And so he created the foundation for them. Over time, the realization was, okay, now that we've built the foundation for these clients that are on our platform, we need to help them drive digital marketing and traffic to their sites. Built out, which was effectively a marketing agency arm to the agency. And I joined that arm after spending years in the digital area, but just not in retail. I'd really grown up in, in tech environmental science. I spent, you know, time in, in education. And so I learned all of the various channels. And now this was the opportunity for me to really pay it towards something that for better or for worse, my husband always like cringe was to put it towards my love of online shopping. And so I really then became an account person. And I went up through the ranks where I started out as a manager, I managed a small team. And that's when I'm I first met you, Mark, and then all the way up through business development, lots of additional clients all the way up to a VP at that point. And what was fascinating was I was able to work with the apparel brands that were my, you know, my passion, like the Calvin Klein jeans and underwear of the world. But also I got to work with Radio Shack or GNC or, you know, some smaller brands. And I really you know, I enjoyed so much the education of working, um, working with all of the leaders of those brands. Plus, I got into the technical side where I spent a lot of calls with the business team managers for the platform and really had to understand the ins and outs to be successful in my, my role. I like to think now, looking back on it, that my partners at the time saw more than just me being responsible for their marketing, but just a trusted advisor overall. Yeah, well, look, we stayed friends um, all these years, and I think we probably met in 2000 in, I don't know, six or seven or something like that. He won't so, tell anybody when yeah. we met. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, you, you're you right. You know, I, I think you had a, first, you had a great bedside manner. You were a good, you know, person, good business partner. You were well-rounded, uh, are well-rounded in the sense that you, you know, you understood the creative aspect of these businesses. And the one that I was working in, you know, had a high level of creativity need uh, because of the brand, but you also understood the sometimes limited capability that the platform, you know, had. So uh, I think everything that you just said is right. During that time uh, that you were at GSI, you know, had you given thought to where this would take you into the future? I think yes, in a way that I knew it was my strategic jump into retail in general. 
I mean, I used to spend, I had young children at the time. And I remember the highlight of my weekend was getting out all of my, my fashion magazines that arrived in the mail that week and my cup of coffee. And I'd have these two little kids running around and I would be, you know, flipping through Vogue and people style watch. And my husband would say, you know, what are you doing? And I would, you know, have to coyly look at them like, oh, I'm looking at magazines. Well, once I joined GSI, it was, I'm doing my homework, I'm doing my work. And I would literally post, you know, each brand and where they were featured so that I could then have that conversation with the client. Um, so I think I knew that it was going to take me into the passion of retail. And at the time, probably a college degree in merchandising would have been something that would have been good for me. I actually worked at the Gap and fold jeans. I can fold a mean pair of jeans, you know, with a perfect side seam in graduate school too. And but it just wasn't something really that had been on my radar. I don't even think I knew merchandising itself was the major at the time. And gosh, it sounds like I was really sheltered. Just so you know, my parents <laughs> are all, you know, my my dad has a PhD in genetic toxicology and pharmacology. My mom is all but dissertation and psychology. So there was always this like very big pressure. You should get a graduate degree. You need to become doctor so-and-so working in a retail environment or a store was just kind of unheard of. I think to them, it just wasn't something that was promoted. I did see that strategic, okay, this is going to help me on my pathway. I can just learn so much. And what was so fascinating for me about the experience I had at GSI was really the access to data in a way that I had never had access to. At any given point, you know, of course it was confidential and I never shared it, was I could see how each business was doing on a given week because I had access to all of the clients that were on the platform from Sports Authority to Ralph Lauren to the clients that I already mentioned. And so while you could see sometimes there would be micro trends that were happening with your client, you could actually understand what was more of a macro trend that was impacting all of retail during a period. And I think it's just from all of that learning and being in the mix with so many different brands, um, the ones that rolled up into me, because it's sometimes I'd have, you know, six or seven brands at the time, always, of course, making them feel like I was, they only had me. I, I was ju I was just going to jump in and say exactly that and make it feel like you know you were the only client if I was the only client that you you might have had and and you did a good job at that. Thank you, I appreciate that. And so that was really I think the the education and you know we joked today I was at GSI that was eventually bought by eBay which made it even more learning opportunities around how does the marketplaces aspect work for your client. It was really that opportunity also that certain clients were willing to try new things at different times. So while, you know, Mark, you know, you'd be, I remember asking you like, we should try this. And you say, well, how do you know it's going to work? You know, you're very challenging and you should have been. And I could say, oh, well, you know, client so-and-so white label, or, you know, I, I, it worked for them. I wouldn't be bringing this to you if I didn't think it was a good opportunity for you. So you always had test and learn cases that you could then try something with one client, see if it was going to be successful and then bring it to another client. That in itself was very exciting to me and just that constant innovation and learning. All your, your comments about communication and psychology. So it's not a surprise to me, and we'll talk about this now before we talk about some of the great brands you've worked in. You're a certified professional coach. Yeah. Tell me about that. What what does it take to become a certified professional coach and what does it really mean? Let's see. So um, about two years ago, I had maybe it's more than two years ago, probably over the last four years, I started working with an executive coach. I actually work with two. I have a, a man coach, male coach and a female coach, and they both coach me on the, sometimes the same topics or different topics. As I was being coached, what I realized is um, through my trajectory, somehow I woke up one day and what became a vice president. When I left uh, eBay, I became, I was a vice president, a very young, under 40 vice president at Land's End. And I relocated my family across the country. And what I realized at the time is that support that I could have used in a coach wasn't there for me, not to anybody's fault or their own, but oftentimes retailers or companies won't pay for a coach until 
you are a VP or you are in your C-suite and they've made that investment in you. And what I realized early on is, as I mentioned to you, I had little kids, you know, running around. I had to deal with snow days and sick kids and and the balance and the imbalance and juggling all the balls in the air in an environment that really wasn't aware of what it was like to be a working woman or a working mom. And so as I started managing and my team started growing, I really started to pay attention and to recognize where you know, managers were becoming managers for the first time and they never had experience leading anybody. They didn't know necessarily what the rules were, what you could say or you couldn't say. And women going out on maternity leave and wanting to make sure that, you know, they kept a, at least their pinky toe in enough that they were going to come back because you had invested all this time in them and wanting them to have the benefit. Now, if they chose not to, I totally understood that as well. It just hit me that while I get so much out of being coached, what if this was my way to pay it forward or pay it back. I had this idea in a coaching session and I said, Alan, I said, you know, I had this crazy idea. I'm thinking about getting my coaching certification and Alan's my coach who's in Canada. We've actually never met in person. It's always been by, via Zoom. I thought he was going to say I was crazy, Mark. I was like, he's going to think I've completely lost my mind. And he says, I think that's a good idea, Sam. I think everything I see about you, I think you'd be a wonderful coach. There's something in you that you already have. And I had had some free time. And so one person had reached out to me because they were interviewing at Amazon and they wanted me to read, you know, their essay that they had to send. And, and what I found is that was feeding my soul. So he says, I think it's a good idea. When we talk in three weeks, let's talk about it more in three weeks. I said, okay, I get off. And, I, and now I'm thinking to myself like, oh, well, where could I get a coaching certification? So I start, you know, I'm on my cell phone. I start Googling. I'm looking around the Philadelphia area and I'm like, okay. And then I thought, oh my goodness, I have always wanted to go to the University of Wisconsin. Just, I have to say that. Um, I think when I was growing up, I was too scared to go away. You know, I grew up in Delaware and I went to the University of Delaware and then my parents went to Europe. So I stayed in my little nuclear geography, because I think that was a comfort zone. And who knows, maybe I wouldn't even have gotten into the University of Wisconsin looking back on it. But I thought, oh, I should see if the University of Wisconsin has a coaching certification program. So sure enough, they do. And I'm reading it. And they say, okay, it'll be $35. Submit your application. And I thought, okay. So I talked to my husband. I'm like, you know, it's $35. What's the worst thing that can happen if I submit? He's like, you should submit it. So literally this is in May. I think it's May maybe of 2018. I'm guessing 2019 somewhere. Years are blending for me. And the next thing I know, it says that I need my whole application due by like Memorial Day weekend. And that is literally five days away. And now I need essays and a reference letter. So I'm freaking out. Like I haven't written a college essay since a very long time ago. <laughs> so I start emailing Alan, Alan, I need your help. I need you to write me a, a letter of reference. I know this is crazy, but you know, he was really, really supportive. Luckily I got in, they took, it was the largest cohort they've taken. I think I was number 41 admitted out of 44. And I mean, I just made it in by like the skin of my teeth and it was just a life changing experience. So what do you have to do? You have to coach. I had to coach 50 hours of coaching recorded sessions with people and so thank you to all my volunteers and guinea pigs. I had to do all of the program learnings for the ICF, the International Coaches Federation. I'm still in the process of working to my International Coaching Federation, the ACC certification. And it's just for me, it's again, that pay it forward thing. It's where can I go? Um, how can I help others? And I recently was doing another program called um, Positive Intelligence by Sherzad Shamin, which has been also very, very um, inspirational. What I learned about from the coaching program is that I personally got so much out of it that as I'm growing and evolving, that that's something that I, I love being able to share that with others. Good story. Good story. Well, I might have to call you someday and, and be coached a little bit. Definitely. I'll see what I can do. Okay. <laughs> or I'll find you the right one. 
some would say that I'm past coaching, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you, you mentioned that you, you picked up your family and, and you moved uh, out to uh, the Land's End business. Uh, you've had a number of good brands, you know, that you've worked with Land's End, David's Bridal, Vitamin Shop. Any similarities in those three experiences that you've had? You know, they were both retailers, established retailers, or in Leanne Zen's case, a cataloger primarily, that had been around for 40, 50, 60 years. And so the commonality in all of them was their technology was, for lack of a better word, woefully behind where it needed to be. And culturally making a shift to a digital thinking or uh, mindset was something very challenging for the organizations. I think it goes back to the psychology, just like I love learning about the businesses, learning about people from the coaching side. I just love learning and diagnosing um, the problem and I like being a fixer. So I enjoyed the, the opportunities I had at all of those brands to fix and bring what was new to them at the time you know, some of it was very much tried and true. They may not have had an affiliate program. They didn't have, you know, a fit solution when that was what was becoming all of the rage that shopping online is very difficult for women. How do I know my shoe size is going to fit? And so bringing even these little, little wins, I found, you know, it was very pleasing for me, gratifying for me. When, when you got to Land's End, from a timing perspective, I would imagine that they had been you know, aggressively uh, moving digital. Um, most businesses were, you know, most catalog businesses were trying to become less reliant on paper, but it was a, you know, an, an old school catalog business. Where were they, you know, on a, I'm not making it up, but on a scale of one to five, five being super duper digitally savvy now, where were they in the food chain? Oh gosh, probably at the time, maybe a two um, in total. And, and I say that mostly because a lot of times what happens is you'll bring in folks into your digital organization that are maybe fours and fives of what their experiences are. But when you look at the, the number of people working the catalog or retail, in the case of David's Bridal and the Vitamin Shop, you're just completely outnumbered. So and sometimes you feel like you're on a big ship and the digital team is trying to row super fast and the rest of the organization is ro rowing at a nice pace, but their collective speed out rows your, your speed. Paper to digital was the buzzword at Land's End and it's where the team wanted to go. And we did make strides in that way. But I have to say, people are surprised, surprised when I tell you, I believe in the value of a catalog. I believe in the value of direct mail. I would never recommend to any of those businesses today to go away from it. Why is that? You know, for Land's End at the volume that they could mail to, the average catalog was 50 cents. Okay, well, you know, they were launching jeans. The average keyword cost of jeans a gene is seven dollars. The average CPC of you know a non-brand keyword is in the dollar range. So the scale and reach that you can get from a catalog is something that digital really, I still don't believe, can fully make up for. Especially when you're talking, I mean, even targeted media. I think social media and influencers and it has changed that a little bit. But definitely the reach and scale you can get from a direct mail piece is, is none like any other. And right now, other than the issues we've had with the postal service for the last uh, few months, which have been quite challenging, now is the time where you can break through clutter in someone's mailbox much easier than you can break through clutter in such a fragmented uh, medium media space in terms of like, you know, what's in my email and now what's on my phone and what's in social media and what's online and what's on my connected TV. And it really is about, you know, ident identifying someone where they are, but, oh, and I can rent a, a mailing list. I can find Mark in a mailing list and maybe mail to him for 50 cents or a dollar or even a dollar 50. And that as an acquisition vehicle or as a repeat, maybe you've lapsed is definitely more more likely that I'm going to catch you than some of these other digital tactics. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you're talking about, you know, the targeting and the cost associated. And there's a couple of things I wanted to comment based upon what you just said. I was on a client call today and we were talking with their digital agency and they were talking about how 
Um, and this is a, a business that very aggressively uses social media and influencers and how Facebook, because of all the privacy changes, seems to be doing some things. And we're, we're like I said, we're recording in the middle of, of March of 2021, seems to be trying some changes in their algorithms to deal with the privacy changes that are coming. And the cost of cost per click and, and the cost per acquisition in these businesses seems to be going up dramatically from January to February and now even into uh, March. Even branded terms on, on Google um, with no other changes of you know, things going on, no, no change in impression share and what have you, uh, those costs are going up as well. So it, despite the fact that we talk so much about how paper you know, uh, other costs, postage and, and printing and paper have gone up over the years. In fact, paper and, and printing haven't gone up uh, nearly to the degree that other channels uh, expenses have gone up. Certainly postage has. But I'm a believer, as you just said, you are, that there is a role for paper um, in these digital businesses. And, and frankly, I think it's borne out by the fact that so many of the digitally native businesses, you know, that ultimately went into, you know, retail as well are using paper uh, to drive customers, for sure. Do you have a direct-to-consumer business? I enjoy connecting with guests on this podcast because it reminds me what I love to do, strategic and tactical consulting for businesses like yours. If you'd like to speak with me about your business and see how you can add a fresh set of eyes to your team, contact me at mark at detailsinteractive.com. Now let's get back to the marketing playbook. So you you spend you know some time at, at Lands End and then where did you go uh, after Lands End? Well, you fleed the Midwest. Oh gosh, I love. I mean, that was one of the hardest decisions to come back. My parents are still there. My mother's family is there. I didn't miss the occasional tornado warning, which I did not was not aware was going to be um, in Dodgeville, Wisconsin, because my family had been more from near Lake Michigan tornadoes are less frequent, but um, I was recruited back by um, an amazing woman. Her name, um, I, ha I have to say was, it makes me a little sad, not a little sad, it makes me very sad, Pam Wallach, um, who is known from her time at The Gap. She recruited me to David's Bridal and I was just so inspired by her. Um, and for most of my career, Mark, I've worked for men. Here I was, you know, trying to be a leader. And a lot of times I would have teams of men and women. And what was, I think something for me was I was looking to evolve my leadership style or become an authentic Sam. You know, I always found myself just like in marketing, like you pick up the things that you like, you test it with other brands. I was also doing that and very much trying to figure out who I was as a leader. And so when I met Pam, who um, passed away this December, just watching her in action was so inspiring to me to be able to see a woman CEO in action, leading a team of men and women, and very authentically herself, um, different from some of the leaders that I've had in a way, and coach had a coaching style versus a more authoritarian, you know, do as I say, even if it's not a good idea, just do it mentality. Yeah. So I picked up my whole family. I remember my husband's family is from the East coast. So I gave my uh, mother-in-law a David's bridal business card, which I had written, had written over my new title and my name. And I wrapped it up for her for Christmas when we came for our visit and uh, she opened the box and she couldn't, she didn't know what it was. What's this? And she was kind of confused, like, wait, you're getting married again? <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 Graham, we're, we're moving back. I'm starting in the new year. And his family was just so, so thrilled. My family, of course, was definitely, you know, disappointed, but it was such an amazing opportunity and to work for her. And I was also really interested in learning about the customer. Here you were, here was Land's End, about 30% of the customer base had been with the company for 25 years plus. I mean, tried and true core customer base. David Bridal, the exact opposite. You know, your bride is with you, what, eight months, 18 months. 
you know, and then they move on. Your customer lifetime value is measured completely differently. It's about the full bridal party. And so for that, for me, was also a career or intellectual challenge that I was very much interested in learning. Of course, you know, we would be happy with repeat brides two times, three times, you know, we would take them all. But it was just a very different way of thinking about it from a marketing challenge and different tactics to engage and very short window. You're constantly in acquisition. It was a combination of the leader plus the opportunity. All right. You know, having worked at two multi, well, I guess Lanzan had stores too, but David's Bridal and Vitamin Shop with, you know, both had, um, you know, lots of stores, digital capabilities you know, the whole buzzword of uh, multi-channel retail or, or omni-channel initiatives, those, that must have been a high priority for you in those businesses, I imagine. You know, some of it was, to your point, omni-channel was a focus, but some of it was also, you know, relearning or readopting the basics. So with um, David's Bridal, ship from store, how can we access the inventory in store from a digital perspective? How can we use digital to drive signups to, for appointments, things like that? But yet in many ways, some of the very you know, tried and true things that you and I know, like you always bid on your brand terms. You want to make sure you own the SERP. You know, there were still, you know, philosophies out there that said, well, why would you bid on your brand terms? We're David's Bridal. We've got two thirds brides in the country wear our dresses. We don't need to be there. And what we started to see at David's was there were in fact little, um, you know, at the time they were ankle biters. Now they're, they're becoming bigger, but web digital only bridal gown stores and bridesmaid stores that were literally nipping at our, at our heels, you know, carving off pieces of our group. And the only thing I didn't also mention to you about bridal is there's only, there's a definitive number of brides every year. So it's not like Land's End, it was like, oh, there's all these possible people. David's Bridal was, oh, there's only about 2 million brides per year and 1.3 million of them are in the David's Bridal category. How do you make sure you get all 1.3 and their party? It was, and sometimes there was a conflict. You know, it would be wrong not to even acknowledge it, the, the struggle was real between credit for sales in both David's Bridal and the vitamin shop of e-com versus retail. And that I think is a challenge of the, those environments because they really are a symbiotic relationship. Customers like you and me, we don't think about the store versus online, the way our P&Ls are set up. They think about the overall brand experience. That's part of, I think, the modernization of the brand or the thinking is when you start to think about the customer and, and that ecosystem. But as you know, it's very hard to measure, so which is a challenge. Juvenescence Life, let's jump. Very different business than the retailers that you uh, have worked in. Uh, your chief marketing officer, tell us about that business. So we actually have a chief brand officer. We, um, we, we call ourselves the demand team. We're the chief brand officer, the digital officer, me, and then our chief commercial officer. The business is very different. We are founded by three entrepreneurs who are known in the biotech healthcare space, uh, Greg Bailey, Deck Dugan, and Jim Mellon. Um, Jim Mellon wrote a book, 2017, around juvenescence and the reason to invest in longevity. And really it's because science is on the precipitous of being able to create therapies and science to really expand, as you mentioned at the front, health span and lifespan. You know, luckily for me, uh, they had recognized that uh, while the core business focuses on RX and machine learning, regeneration, that there's many types of products that can be brought to market in a consumer business. So they tapped Colin Watts, who was the CEO of the vitamin shop when I was recruited into the vitamin shop. And he reached out to me and said, hey, Sam, I'm working on this startup. What, what do you think? And so I consulted for about nine months and then I, I joined full time. And what's been really exciting about Juvenescence is, well, Unfortunately, I don't see them in my fashion magazines anymore, but, uh, you know, I'm now at a different life stage where aging and longevity and my parents' ages and 
you know, being a parent makes it that much more uh, applicable to me. And this idea that now I'm able to um, help others live, not just live longer. We've done a lot of market research where people say, if I'm going to live to 120, but feel terrible, like I'm not interested. It really is about, you know, living a healthier life. Greg always asks, you know, what would you do if you could, if you could live healthy, you know, Mark, if you could live to any age you wanted to and be healthy, how, what age would you want to live to? Forever. I'd live forever, frankly, if I was going to be healthy. Right. I'd live forever. I think I answered like 150. I don't even think I can even imagine what it was like, but that's really um, the idea. You know, if the average, average life expectancy today is 77, you know, for kids born today, I think it's like 103, 104. And so really what we think about and have think about life and how our healthcare paradigm has really been set up as sick treat. This is the idea that says, okay, there are preventative things that we can do along the way and we can, we can bring them to market. We said, I said, this sounds great. And so uh, Joe, who's our chief brand officer, Colin, um, who I mentioned, and I started down the very early, you know, looking for a brand agency. We started out at the very basics, you know, what is your mission statement? Who is your target audience? Who do you want to be when you grow up? We did all of that work. It was, okay, we need an e-com platform. You know, I think one of the things that some people have asked me along the way when they say, okay, you worked with these three retailers, you know, part of the things you think about is, okay, if I could just start over from scratch, get rid of everything that is from, you know, the 1984 mainframe, which is the equivalent of the Dig Dug game I used to play in fourth grade, put it over here that this whole business is built on and build something from scratch, what would I choose? Like if I could pie in the sky, at what would I choose? I've found that it's tougher to rebuild something that has all this legacy bad stuff than it is to, you know, start with a, a clean, fresh piece of paper. Completely. You know, one of the things I learned along the way is when I got to Land's End, I really thought, oh, they just need to replatform their website. Well, the website sits here, you know, up above everything else. If it's sitting on old stuff, that new site hooks into the old stuff and automatically then whatever is old is going to be given then to the client. Absolutely. Lipstick on the pig is going to skew bacon bits type of thing. Sorry for the visual. I, I, that's a good one. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to have to write that one down. <laughs> You're going to adopt it. <laughs> so for Juvenescence, other than potentially budget constraints, it's really been this exercise of, you know, if you could build it from scratch and do it right, what would you do? That's just been an amazing place to be for the last uh, two years. Fortunately, also because we're a startup, all of us were executives from folks from J&J. &J. We've all had long careers. So we're an experienced group of folks. We, you know, people are sitting in Princeton. We have people in the UK and in San Francisco. And we were already using Zoom and already doing, you know, a lot of our meetings virtually and, and getting together, you know, maybe meeting at an agency in the city or at one point we had a shared office. So when COVID hit, it was like, oh, we just have to zoom more. And so it really, I think, prepared us for COVID in a way that I think other larger businesses weren't prepared for initially. But hands down, one of the best things I think about the company and the founders is because we are based in science. We're the marketing group, the demand team I told you about. I mean, we're the smallest of the organization. The organization are scientists. They were sending out you know, emails about what's happening in COVID, what you need to do. I, at one point I had like a scare. I thought I might have it. And Greg, the CEO out of the UK is sending me notes, you know, just really overall the right place for me to be at this point in time. That's great. Well, best of luck to you on, on that. Can't wait to see the website, the web platform go up and to see the, the product uh, that you guys yeah, are bringing to market. Right now we've actually, we have a content site up. We um, have a wait list for metabolic switch, our first product, and we're bring it to market in the next 30 days or so. So it's super exciting. That's great. Uh, before we end the, the show, um, you, you are a part of Women in Retail uh, Leadership Circle. 
um, I wanted to just give a shout out to that. I, I know a, a bunch of women in our industry that participate in that. Just quickly, uh, what is that organization? So women in retail. Um, so I was an advisory board member for a little over almost four years. Now I've sort of retired into what's called a founding member. member. Um, but it's really an organization that was designed by Total Retail, um, Napco Media, to bring women together from across these great organizations to provide that support that I had mentioned to you that I think you know women were needing and to be able to share a vo- share a voice. And some of my biggest learnings, not all my biggest learnings, but I remember sitting in one of those women in retail leadership conferences when I was working at Land's End. And it was just even a topic about negotiation. You know, women are not the best negotiators for themselves. Listening to these executive women talk about where they had been before, what mistakes they've made. I mean, none of our journeys, not yours, not mine, has been this perfect, you know, moment. It's really about getting up and falling down and then getting up again. And so finding this, I want to say it is, it's, it's very much like a sisterhood of connections or networking that is a common experience. And then through that, again, a way to pay it forward, whether it's, for me, it's been writing occasionally an article or meeting people and, you know, participating in that way. That's great. Yeah. I've heard lots of good things and, and seen lots of events that uh, have been organized. So, All right. Two minute drill as we end our show. Okay. One word, two words, tops as your answers. You're ready. Mm-hmm. Okay. A brand that you admire or that inspires you. Tory Burch. The favorite app on your phone. Positive intelligence. Last website other than Amazon that you shopped from. Tory Burch. Tory Burch <laughs> for the <laughs> for the double. Something that you're not good at, but that you wish that you were. Tennis. A charitable organization that you're passionate about. Building Brave. If you had one superpower, what would it be? Boundless energy. You already have boundless energy. I thought you were going to go with the live forever thing because of juvenescence. But and the last one, other than family, what's your most prized possession? My engagement ring. Okay, great. Sam, it was great to catch up with you. Thanks for making the time. I know you're busy getting this business uh, launched. Great to see you. Good stories here. Um, I'm sure the listeners are going to really enjoy it. So thank you again. Thank you, Mark. Always great to catch up with you. That's it. Today's game ball goes to Sam Norpel for coming on the Marketing Playbook. To me, today's three game-winning marketing plays were as follows. Number one, pay it forward. We hear about that so often on the show. People who have had time to formulate their careers, looking for ways to give back to those that are starting out. You heard Sam talk about becoming a career coach and how it's impacted her positively, both personally and professionally, but she's using the skills she developed throughout her career and the tactics she learned in the program to make meaningful difference in people's lives. Number two, Sam spoke about having access to details. There's so much data available to us, but businesses often forget that it's not enough to just have the data. You need to have the tools to organize it, then to analyze it. But most importantly, you need the people to interpret it and then determine the management actionable steps to improving your business. And number three, leadership style. What's your leadership style and how has it changed over time? We have some part of our style that I believe is innate, having been developed over many years of working. Are you watching the people you work with and taking from them the best that they bring to their teams? If not, you should be. Learn from everyone to help craft your leadership style. Thank you, Playbook Marketers, for listening to another episode. If you want to check out more pages of the Marketing Playbook, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast spot and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also follow us on Twitter at Details Interact and learn more at DetailsInteractive.com. Until next time, the devil is in the details.